This is Robert Williscroft. I'm the author of Slingshot and the Star Child Compact and the forthcoming book, The Iapetus Federation, three books in the Star Child series. I'm here with Trenton Bennett, who did the audio version for Slingshot and the Star Child Compacts and who will be doing the audio version for the Iapetus Federation when it is ready. Hi, Trenton. Hi, Robert. Good to talk to you. So the reason why we are talking with one another is to allow my fan base to get a better idea of who and what you are. Good deal. So let's start off by my asking you, what inspired you to become an audiobook narrator in the first place? Well, I was always an avid reader, and in fact, I loved science fiction most of all. But at the same time, I had kind of a natural voice, and I liked telling people about the stuff I'd read, talking about these stories that fire the imagination. And yet, I also really enjoyed telling these stories. I kind of admire the way a writer can put together a story and bring it from beginning through middle and end and give that to us. It's not something that I necessarily have the stamina I suppose to do. And yet, as my daughter grew older, one of my favorite things to do was to also read stories to her. So I came up with the idea that this is something that I love doing. It feels very natural to me. And over the course of reading to my child, who I'm thankful has grown up to be quite the intelligent young lady, I discovered that I really enjoyed trying to breathe life into those characters. As a reader, I always like to try to get into the characters' heads, and that's one of the reasons I talk about books. As a narrator, I then try to pass that along to the listener so that hopefully they can get a feel of what really drives these characters and why they are the way they are. You know, I think I can understand where you're coming from, especially because several of the reviewers of the audio version of both of the books commented on your ability to breathe life into the characters so that they always knew who was saying what just from how you presented the character audibly. I love to hear that because it's a little bit of vocal gymnastics, but it's one of those things that... To me, I feel like that's the very least I can do. So, having said that, what's your favorite thing about narrating audiobooks? I think my favorite thing about it is that the audiobook market has become such an amazing, booming thing. You have not only a lot of people who want to listen, but then people who like to do immersive reading, where they'll listen to me and maybe they're reading the book as well. And so as I'm narrating my audiobook, I really like to try to imagine that I'm there with the reader. When I first started thinking about how I was going to build the quality of my reads, I listened to other narrators and I asked myself, which of these people gives me the sensation that they're sitting in the room across from me in another comfy chair and they're only here because they want to share this story and tell it to me? So in my mind, as I'm narrating an audiobook, I'm thinking of someone who I want to share this with, and we're just together like when I'm reading to my daughter, and it's just a moment where I love this and I want to share it with you. I think that comes across in both Slingshot and the Star Child Compact. I can remember there were several there were several scenes where we discussed how to do it. We went back and did it a couple of times, and we ended up with something that worked for me as the writer and you as the person who was presenting it to that reader sitting in the easy chair. So I think that worked well. I love to hear that because I think probably the biggest challenge is that as an author, you have a very definitive picture in your mind of how things should be, how people should sound and behave. And that's not something that can come across with letters on a page. So a lot of times when I come in and do a performance, there's some of that where I'm having to create my own from whole cloth, and then there's some of that where you just have to, um, I guess, compromise gracefully and say, okay, the thing in my head isn't something we can put to a mic, so let's see what we can get between the two of us. I feel like it's a group effort, you and I both working on the same thing, and that makes it even more real to me because it's something that we get to share as we work on it. And we had fun doing that. <laughs> we certainly did. I'm so looking when you, forward to the next one. When you think about narrating both Slingshot and the Star Child Compact, 
do any particular scenes jump out at you? They stand out in your mind from either book or both. Actually, you know what? There's there's a few in each of them, but I'm going to go ahead and pick one from each because I think they really typify the thing. Uh, I'll start with Slingshot. There's a scene in Slingshot where we have several characters who are trying to coordinate on deck and they're getting ready to drop these giant anchors into the ocean that will help kind of hold things together. And during the midst of all this chaos, you have some radio chatter, you have someone carefully organizing things, you've got people who are trying to coordinate between a crane operator and divers. And what this meant was, since I had a profile of all of these people that gave me the general nature of their voices and who they were, I had to think of how to portray these people, even though several of them are New Yorkers and then some of them are from Philly. I needed to be careful and give each of them a kind of a distinct voice, despite the fact that some of them may have come from about the same neighborhood or the same area. And they're all saying just general chatter. They're not giving you deep, rich things about their lives. They're saying things like, I need to dive. You know, you've got your Scottish character. So narrating that whole thing was fun because all of a sudden something happens. There's a little bit of action there. There's some suspense and... Uh, there's a certain particularly crazy maneuver that one of the characters pulls off. And I loved being able to establish these people, walk you through them somewhat distinctly, and then throw in the action and the adventure. That's uh, that's the slingshot scene. If we switch gears to the Star Child Compact, I really do enjoy... It's funny, there's so much that happens in the Star Child Compact that's more technological and fascinating and there's amazing things. But then there's one small, simple scene with Michelle and Captain John Stock where they're in an environment that they're trying to figure out and Michelle is going off on her own. And on the one hand, she's alone with her thoughts about herself, but on the other, she's She's activating that biological mind of hers that, that says, okay, what is this environment? What is this like? And she's working through this problem and using the doctor as a sounding board. And then she just kind of cheerfully decides to go get her equipment and do a little bit more digging. And there was something about the nature of narrating that to where my very favorite line was where Captain Stock is sitting under a tree thinking to himself, and she just walks up to him, gathers her things, and says, bees and walks off, as if that just explains everything. It was really charming to read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you just in describing it, you put me right back into it. I like that. <laughs> Thanks. She, she was a fun character to write about because she was a woman, a scientist, a girl, a child, an explorer, an adventurer, all of those things packaged into a Nice, visually appealing package. <laughs> there was a lot of depth to these characters, I will say. And she was one that I really hope the listeners and the readers understand a little bit more inside of her head, because there is a lot there. Well, now, well, that's a beautiful segue into who was your favorite character in Slingshot? Ah, well, you know, it's funny you should say that, because... We've got a lot of smart people in both of these books. They're some of the world's best, and they, they're put to solving some of the toughest problems. And as far as voicing those characters, I think probably my favorite to do in Slingshot is going to be Klaus. And I say that because he's based on a good friend of mine who I spent several years with who's from Germany and has a very easy patter to his voice. But he's a very different personality. This person has has a little bit more of a sharp wit and a sense of humor that he likes to try to express, despite the fact that in some ways his project is all business. So it's kind of fun to have him randomly inject that humor and to be able to voice voice him in a way that I think kind of borrows from the way that my friend used to speak, or I guess does still speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Klaus, he's a good guy. He was He was very fun. Now, what about Star Child? What's your, what's your favorite there? Well, in the Star Child Compact, I'd have to say that Ginger Steel was my favorite. And I give you that because she was the toughest challenge to voice. I wanted to give somebody who has that kind of Australian, New Zealand, that region kind of an accent. 
But as an American who isn't born and raised there or who isn't born and raised in the UK, there's that balance where you need to train your ear and your mouth so that you you don't sound too English. And at the same time, you don't open your mouth so much. You sound like you're dubbing an Outback Steakhouse commercial. So she was a wonderful balance in between. And I think the reason that I enjoyed voicing her so much was very early on in the book, she just looks right at Dimitri and says something in Russian. And when I was initially auditioning for the book and that scene was in there, I said to myself, I need to make a really convincing female accent with that Australian style inflection. And she needs to be able to speak Russian like she's pretty good at it at the same time. So those layers of complexity were a challenge that I think was fun to take on. And she really shocked Dimitri when she did it. (laughs) Yes, that was part of the fun, too. I think Dimitri felt he was going to be pretty lonely kicking off the adventure, and it turned out not to be that way at all. (laughs) And I think I had already mentioned at one earlier time in our discussion that Ginger is modeled after a very special person in my life. I was very impressed to learn that. I hope she's okay with my impersonation. (laughs) She loved it. (laughs) Great. All right. Now we're going to get to not what was fun, but what was difficult. What was the hardest thing that you had to do when you were narrating both these books? (laughs) I've got to say, that's pretty easy for me to pick out because there were some challenges I mentioned earlier trying to make sure I have five or six New York accents and they all sound somewhat distinct. But I would say the hardest thing to do, and I really appreciate your collaboration on this, was being able to incorporate those bits from the High Iron Mohawks. There's a little story that you probably don't know about me, and that's that one of my favorite teachers in college was an anthropology professor who actually spent time in New York State studying Native Americans and going to more than one reservation. She told a lot of really good stories about Native American culture, and we studied them a little bit in some of my classes. But when it came time to do the High Iron Mohawks, these are very real people who are still around, who had a major story to tell in America's history that maybe not everyone's aware of. I started doing research on these people and was fascinated. And then came that challenge of knowing that they're going to be speaking in their typical New Yorker accent and interjecting all of these words in Mohawk that I will go ahead and admit no one from the Mohawk reservation is going to listen to me and say, Wow, that guy really nailed it. But we did work really hard together with that. Uh, You'd given me a couple of resources, and I found a Mohawk language lesson in which they went over the way various sounds are pronounced, especially in tandem with each other. And I took the individual pieces of all of these words and phrases, and I put them together in a grid in which I mapped out how each syllable would go if it's up against this syllable versus that syllable, Then I lumped the phrases together in the appropriate syllable pronunciation, spelled it out phonetically, and I drilled for quite a while to get the pronunciation to where it sounds pretty fluid and I didn't sound like I was speaking choppy little chunks of syllables. So that was definitely the hardest thing I have had to do. (laughs) And I'll tell you what, I'm impressed. I, I knew that you had done a good job, but I didn't realize how much you'd put into it. And it came out, it it came across very natural, and I too do not speak Mohawk, and my ear isn't tuned to it, but I think that the average person who listens to that will get the very real sense that this could really be just like that. It's a little bit like when you perform on the stage. Ultimately, everybody who's participating really does, they're there for a story, they want to be entertained, and they do understand that you're not all of these different things, just like I'm I'm not at all Michelle, and I will never become the president of France or the first lady of France, so that's not going to happen. But <laughs> I didn't mean to shoot down one of my dreams there, but uh, you get the idea is that a lot of people, they want a really good ride. They want a good story. But I really feel like that story needs to have the best possible attempt to make it sound as convincing as possible, to keep you more engaged in the story and less worried about whether that New York accent was really New York enough. <laughs> I think that uh, one of the things that our collaboration has done, especially for Slingshot, uh, less so for the Scarchow Compact, 
in the slingshot, I tried to bring together people from various walks of life, like the Mohawk high iron workers, like the Gula Geechee oil field diver, like Navy SEAL guys and NOAA diver people. And I tried to bring these folks together, the, the, the Texas, the, the Texas bush pilot and so on, and show that great projects are accomplished because people from all walks of life put everything they got into making it work. And not all of those jobs are critical to the overall construction. And yet, if they're not accomplished, it doesn't happen. And I think that your giving life to them with your voice really helped bring that across. So uh, many thanks to you for that. Oh, I appreciate that. You know, you mentioned that. And and I will say, the woman who was Gullah Geechee, there's this whole scene with her that's very tense. It's very touch and go. And she's really intense. And that's probably the closest I came to really dramatic stage acting with her because I wanted to I wanted to try to project that whole sense of unbelievable joy and relief as she's able to rescue this poor person who would have drowned without her playing that role, without her being ready to just jump in a boat and tear off across the water to go rescue. It's really great stuff. And her comment, you the man. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your chatting with me and giving us all some insight into what it means to be a audiobook narrator. Thanks, Robert. It's my pleasure, and I certainly look forward to working with you in the future. I can't wait to see the Iapetus Federation come out. That'll be awesome.